we've got a no show. Yeah. Oh, oh. We have a no Zoom. No ways. <laughs> Alexis, lovely to meet you. You too. How's Are you it going? guys haven't met yet, have you? No, yeah. we haven't met yet. Yeah. <laughs> cool stuff. Virtually. Yeah. yeah no, not yet. <laughs> We're super excited to chat to you. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> Waking at dawn. Good stuff. Well, good afternoon there, Alexis Ray. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. I'm glad I could make it. I think my whole life was all about getting to this moment, mate. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a good Well, it almost never happened before we started this podcast. You almost lost your big toe trying to put your <laughs> earphones into your computer. So, um, yeah, that's, that doesn't even make sense. Earphones and big toe. But somewhere, if somebody wants to know, there's details, no doubt. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Luckily, we have that all recorded so we can show people. A awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we can use it as like content for your, uh, you know, podcast guest course and show uh, people, you know. <laughs> reality is a podcasting. I like that. I like that. Yeah. There Blue were no expletives at all. None at all. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the world is definitely like an awesome place. And, you know, thanks to you listening to one of our guests, uh, Emily Penn, on our podcast, mm -hmm. basically, you know, you found out about us. And then ever since then, we've basically been in touch. So it's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to know you. Oh, the feelings mutual times times more, whatever that is, because mm -hmm. yeah, it's. I mean, you guys bring so much quality and content and people and and love to the world and support and and it just and 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 it just keeps going. You know, it just keeps going, and I'm just so grateful that it, that that was the reason why it was Emily. Uh, so yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. So so look, your life certainly has been colorful. That's for sure. And there's also been a lot of dark moments. It's actually almost impossible to kind of imagine that you've had you know, such a tough life, like knowing, you know, we, knowing as we know you now, you know, you're such a charismatic and energetic lady. Nice. Um, so you were born in West Palm in Florida and you're the oldest of four kids. It was like pretty tumultuous times by the sounds of it. And at, at seven years old, you, your mom had twins, um, but they were actually from different fathers, which is rather interesting. And your yeah. mom, she actually wasn't embarrassed to tell you that. Um, no, my, my mother had a, had a wonderful knack for being incredibly inappropriate and lacking boundaries. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, that was a little zinger she laid on me. Yeah, wow, uh, crazy. And, and can you maybe just take us back to those early years, like uh, what your memories are of them? Hmm. So uh, what I remember prior to the twins being born is that, that life seemed pretty normal. Um, didn't really know much difference. Um, uh, it, it was later when things got really bad and I was old enough to understand what was going on that, um, that, uh, yeah, took a turn. But before that, uh, it was normal. I remember happy times. I remember getting spoiled at Christmas. You know, I remember that stuff. And I, and I remember that when the twins were born, life went upside down. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Mm, yeah, it's must it be really, yeah, what a big shock. And then, like you said, your mom just kind of just telling you just like that, that now you've got, yeah. you know. You got twins yes. from different. Yeah, so a woman can can have a second egg fall um, after she's pregnant, and that's what happened. And so that's how uh, my twin brothers have different fathers. Yeah, that's uh, crazy. Yeah, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that that can even happen. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah. one in a zillion, like yeah. crazy numbers. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That was my house. <laughs> wow. So, so maybe maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your parents, Don and Laurie, um, and maybe just tell us what they were like and 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 how things were with them. Yeah, well, thanks for asking. Um, my father, Don, I didn't remember him. Um, I didn't meet him really until I was seven or eight. Oh, that was a classic story. Um, I met, so I didn't know, I didn't remember that, um, that my stepfather wasn't my real dad. I didn't remember that my real dad, Don, tried to kill me with a pillow, I know, and, try, and hurt me so badly I was in the hospital. Um, I didn't remember any of that. Um, uh, my, my mom and Maurice married and we moved to New Jersey and Maurice was my dad as far as I knew. Um, so uh, then one day this, this thing happened and got my hair all dolled up and I heard that Daddy Don was coming and I sat on my, my porch waiting for him to show up and um, that uh, my brother and I were going to go away with Daddy Don. He was actually, as my mom put it, that's your real father, but he tried to kill you when you were a baby. So we got oh, away wow. from him. Have a nice weekend. 
Wow. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> to God, wow. that happened. And I remember crying pretty much the whole time, scared to death of this strange redheaded man and um, um, hanging onto my brother's hand and just, just clutching it. Just like, what the fuck just happened? Who are we with? What is this about? Jeez. What do you mean he tried to kill me? Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so why did they, why did, why was she fobbing you off that weekend? And oh, with she, the... uh, I don't know. I guess um, several years had passed since he'd seen his kids and he decided that he wanted to come by. Often he said he would come by and he didn't make it. So I would sit there with my hair and pigtails and daddy Don wouldn't show up. Mm. But uh, eventually he, Eventually he did, and we would uh, we would spend some time with him. Uh, as, as is the case with kids, they realize which parent w is more willing to spoil them. And so after a while, we figured out pretty quickly that Daddy Dom was willing to get us some cool shit. So we went with him. <laughs> He's like, <"That's> fine. <laughs> he doesn't hurt me. <laughs> you know? So it, it turned out okay. Uh, but but uh, Maurice, the stepdad in the in the picture. Um, my mom initially said that he was wonderful. He took Dane. So Dane and I have, Don is our dad. Dane and I have, are not the twins um, set of parents. Um, <clears throat> and um, he, my mom said that, that Maurice treated us, took us in as his own, um, that he was quite lovely about that. Uh, but something happened somewhere along the lines, um, right around the time that the kids were born. My mom had said that she was going to divorce Maurice, actually. Uh, I did not know that he was dealing cocaine. I did not know that that's what they were doing with their, you know, motorcycle weekends. I didn't know because I was so little. I didn't understand why Maurice would move out and have a girlfriend and I would meet her. And, you know, like there is, there, it was just, she was just kind of, it was all kind of crazy. But yeah. that's what seemed normal to us. I mean, Jeez. we didn't know anything else. So. Mm -hmm. Wow. So confusing eh? as a kid, like all that stuff going on, not knowing who these people are and, and anything like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned uh, Maurice there and, and from what I understand of your story is that Maurice actually started abusing you as a kid as well. Is that right? Yes, he did. Um, it, it, he did. So uh, I, I learned about um, being a sexual being before I really understood what was going on. Mm. And um, he was also very inappropriate around the house. He would, he would um, be exposed, although he had a robe on, he would purposely expose himself. Um, mm. Yeah, he was really inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so I didn't understand, of course, and the twin, my twin brothers, you know, they, they were, I was like, is this what we do? Is this what we do? You know, and the twin brothers are like a year old or two years old or something, because this went on for a while. And, and they're like, N no, that no, sis, you know, so I didn't understand what was happening to me and or why. It was interesting wow. that later in life, when I told my mom what had happened, it's like it went in one ear and out the other. In fact, she accused uh, my real father of, of being an, a, a sexually abusive person. I'm like, I told you it was Maurice. I've told you before it was Maurice. Like, wow. how do you not hear that? Mm. How do you not know that, you know? So but she didn't want to take any sort of responsibility or, or like believe you no. on that kind of thing? No, no, no. Oh. And, and what's, your, what's your relationship like with your mom these days? There isn't one. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'll tell you, um, I was, uh, so I've had moments where, um, you know, I had to pretend like she was dead for, for a decade because going back to the person that hurt you to try and discuss something usually doesn't work. And I learned that. Mm -hmm. It's kind mm. of like asking the liar to tell the truth. Finally, it's not going to happen. Mm, so yeah. I learned to just, you know, tr tr heal on my own. And she was also instrumental in my life at certain points. She gave me Jonathan Livingston Seagull to read uh, when I was 21. And that was just the, the, you know, all of a sudden my eyes were open and I never, I never shut them again. My mother is mm. a trained medium. She has got a tremendous spiritual background. I've, it doesn't help her personality, which is a, a shame, but, but uh, all that aside, uh, I got it. I got a text message from her. It's been a few years. You know, I got a missed call and, uh, and I, and I texted back and I said, uh, I'm, and I went through so much, you know, you can imagine guys. I was like, oh, my mother reached out to me. Oh my God. Wow. Um, of wow. I had just been looking through some Christmas stuff and I found a card that I got for her. And, you know, I, I, I'm a very sentimental person. I still have many mm -hmm. things around here that, that she made for me over mm -hmm. the years. And, mm -hmm. I, and I started to text those things and how are you? And finally, I just erased it all. And I said, um, I see that I missed a call from you. 
And she said, oh yes, I'm transferring contacts from one phone to the other. As we used to say in the phone business, pardon the ring, ma'am. That oh, was it. What? No ways. Pardon the ring. Oh. Jesus. You know, it's such a shame, like, done. Yes. like she sounds like, you know, like maybe being a medium, she's working with people. She's like connected with like, you know, you, you'd imagine that she'd just have more like, I don't know. Um, what she has is animosity for her daughter. And um, last time I saw her, she, she started harping on me about things I did when I was nine or 12. And I was like, Jesus, I was a kid and you're still carrying that shit around. Wow. That's I feel crazy. sorry for her. You know, wow. yeah, it's, it's I know she's missing yeah. out on a good kid. <laughs> you yeah. know? It's amazing totally. how people just hold on to stuff and then also blame their kids. How can you blame your nine year old? Seriously? Like what's going on there? Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's messed up. <laughs> yeah, that is messed up. Tell me about and it. And then also not take the responsibility of having different dads, putting them through the, like, it's your fault that you, you know, like it's so, it's so obvious that you had, you, any of the issues you might have had were obviously coming from the disruptive home, you know? So like, it's just crazy, isn't it? But, you know, you also, um, you also moved around a lot, which is also disruptive and, and probably quite tough at times. But um, later on, you actually wanted to become a chiropractor. And, uh, but that resulted in you finding other talents uh, that you had, like cooking. Yeah, see, um, I had cheated going through high school. Um, I would write the answers on the side of my sneaker. I did anything I could to get straight A's because it was one less thing that I would be in trouble for. So it was really a survival technique. And uh, it didn't do me any favors when I got into college. And so come, right, come the first, uh, first semester, really, um, organic chem right out of the gate. And, you know, that was the death knoll. And then there were a few others. And one by one, I ended up making more Rice Krispie treats than good grades. And I just, I just left. I had to. I had to leave. Um, and that was when my dad stepped in because he got me into college. My dad really did become like a resource book on a shelf. You know, he wasn't really emotionally attached kind of guy. But if I really needed something, he would be there. And in this particular case, he helped me to get to school. And then he said, well, since that didn't work out, how about if you come up to Rhode Island? I've got time to be a dad. Hmm. So I lived with him and I knew immediately that culinary wasn't for me. I said, dad, I should be in film school. I love film, television, radio. That's where I should be. And he's like, you will finish. Oh, You're setting up precedence for grades in this college. I'm like, yeah, no pressure, dad. Thanks so much. <laughs> I hate it, but okay. <laughs> Hot diggity. Oh. <laughs> that happened. Well, and, and didn't you, you went, you did actually end up finishing it though, didn't you? And you, and you worked, I think on a super yacht or something. I did. I did actually. Uh, I, I just want to backtrack just one second. Yeah, because this is a really important thing. I am the mm. age right now. I'm, I'll, I'll be 56 in a week. So mm. my dad was this age, actually. He was 55 mm. when this happened. And I was a senior in college and the senior trip, uh, uh, was going to um, uh, Spain and North Africa. And I had taken a position working at my dad's company to help with his personnel issues. And I said, dad, the class is going to Spain and North Africa. And he's like, just because you're my daughter doesn't mean you get to go on vacation. And I was like, dad, <laughs> this is graduation for like the top school in the country. And I'm like, summa cum laude, I work my ass off. How can you say no? Because you don't get special privileges just because you're my daughter. And I said, dad, just because you have lived this kind of life, I'm telling you, I'm going. I'm not going to see Spain and North Africa the same at 55 as I will at 25. Well, it turns yeah. out I would because of who I am now. But back then, <laughs> I was like, fuck that, man. I'm looking at him looking old and mad, you know? And I was like, uh-uh, I'm going. I'm going. I don't <laughs> care. And his girlfriend ended up being my, my roommate. We had a blast. Oh, my wow. God. It was so much, I probably chapped his butt a little bit. But, yeah, she was a hoot. And we, did, we went. <laughs> You know, and as soon as, I got, as soon as I got done with school, um, I took a job on a yacht, a private yacht that I'd been a guest on once. And uh, yeah, didn't know I would be the seasick chef. <laughs> oh, no ways. <laughs> what would you oh. like with your dinner there, you guys? A bit of <laughs> a nice little I topping. Dude, I thought it was going to be my Jimmy Buffett lifestyle. I mean, I'm playing like White Snake. Here I go again on my own. My little brother's like, yes, just go, 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 go. It's like, finally, bro, finally, I'm free. Uh-uh. I got out of the intercoastal waterway. I was blowing it all oh, over the side man. of the boat. And it never went away because we, we stayed docked in, uh, in West Manhattan all summer. So we never really got out on the ocean. 
that, that we'd go to Martha's Vineyard and back and forth. Um, but I got to cook for the Kennedys and Art Buckwald and a bunch of other famous people. And it was really fun because the charter guest was such a jerk, but it was so much fun to spend his money in these Balducci's and fine markets. And <laughs> that was when I started carrying a Super Bowl. I would carry a Super Bowl from the yacht and I would bounce it all the way through what I called Rat Park because all these rats would jump out of the bin. <laughs> <laughs> and I had this little grocery cart to get all my stuff and I would bounce the Super Bowl and it would keep me going and people would be like catching it and stuff. I remember people saving it like men in business suits with briefcases, stopping it from the grate. And that's when I started still have one. See? Nice. That's so cool. <laughs> so so was that like a was that like a technique to like just engage with people and like Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. And it also kept me moving. I was yeah. nervous. I'm you know, I'm walking through some shady parts of town. In, in in New York and I don't even I, don't, I, I can't get out of the mall I have no sense of direction at all so I was <laughs> nervous you know there weren't cell phones and stuff yet not in my yeah, you, you so you decided to attract attention in the in the dangerous places with a shiny uh, bouncy ball <laughs> it didn't light up and I wasn't attracting attention I was moving fast on purpose Fair it enough. kept me running it, I had a reason for doing that it wasn't to mm -hmm. Just to try and engage strangers although that was pretty fun um it wasn't exactly why it was really literally to keep me busy okay. so that people wouldn't find me strolling with a Fair cart mm -hmm. yeah so, you had intention in the movement. <laughs> yeah 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 you learned some good survival tactics there yeah. um <laughs> Yeah, uh, I actually uh, I, I liked your little trick as well of school of writing on your on your shoe. I've never heard of that one to actually <laughs> take damn as a mistake. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that worked out well until yeah. I had to actually remember what I was cheating my way through. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, just to say, organic chemistry almost got me as well in first year because I also cruised at school, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a rough one. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. all look, and I kind of <clears throat> excuse me. I think if something's really desperate in for us we'll find a way through it um i had uh, looked into chiropractic i'd been a chiropractic assistant and i was really mortified at the idea of seeing a cadaver and having to go through all that and i really wasn't certain 1000 percent certain that i wanted to have a career of of dealing with people that were always complaining and not well um i'd already been exposed to that as a chiropractic assistant so so that i let it dissuade me or that i wasn't ready for it i'm okay with that um, and then, you know, going through culinary school allowed me to put my chef's knives uh, in my backpack and just, you know, know yeah. that I could get a job somewhere. Yeah, that's super cool. So, so at the age of 26, you basically, you just sold everything you owned and you bought a one-way ticket to Anchorage in Alaska. Uh, yeah. what, what prompted you to kind of do that and like what actually happened on that trip and what was the outcome? So I learned when I was in Rhode Island and I wanted to go work for peace at the John Denver Foundation mm -hmm. that uh, the people around me in Rhode Island were like, you can't do that. You're a guy. You don't have a job. You don't know anybody. <laughs> and I, let, I, thought, I threw that ticket in the trash and I said, the next time I do something like this, I'm not telling everybody everything. And so what happened is uh, somebody from culinary school got a, got a gig on a, on a uh, uh, cruise ship up and down the passage in Alaska. So I had a little bit of travel envy. So I put in my notice at work. I was working at Marriott in the catering department. And I put in my notice and, uh, and I told everybody, uh, I'm going to California where there's lots of restaurants and, and I have tons of relatives. And two out of three, <laughs> nice. two. there are lots of restaurants and I do have relatives in California. And I was going to Alaska. And I looked... <laughs> I learned not to say everything. So I sold everything in a yard sale and I, um, got, you know, it was one of those like pre dawn hours, the taxi came and I had what I thought I needed for the rest of my life. The rest of it was in a yard sale and it was a big heavy duffel bag. So I thought that's what you did. And I threw some weed in the bottom, in the bottom of the bag and the bag went under <laughs> carriage and the, in the plane. And I, it was still that early time and we could fly with that stuff. I guess I wow. made it. <laughs> I figured between that and my knives, I'd be fine. Right. And I had no idea what I would do when the plane landed. All I knew was that I was taking care of my brothers again and I was mom again. And I almost got into it, like literally got into it with my mother because one of the twins was selling drugs out of the house. Um, these kids had never been taught even how to balance a checkbook. They didn't know anything. And I was, I was mom all over again, hmm. 26 mom again. Hmm. And I just said, I'm out. So I left. 
And um, <laughs> it's a long flight. It's a long flight, one nonstop from Daytona to Alaska. It's a long time to sit next to somebody. So I had a lot of time to chat with the 12 year old next to me. <laughs> and, uh, she was a doll. And she said, um, my dad's a doctor in town and we often put people up. So, um, you know, I don't know. And uh, maybe we could go. And I said, yeah, let's go meet your dad. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what my first step was, is I, I met her dad and he said, sure, I'll take you in for a bit and figure out what you're doing next. And uh, I got a little restless. So I ended up at the youth hostel and I roomed up with somebody that I'd actually seen on the plane. And uh, mm. yeah, that began the Alaskan adventure. Yeah. And then, and then didn't you go sleep in a tent or something like that? And then you met some like Australians and that was like a nice awakening or introduction to Aussies for you. Uh, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, I, uh, I figured Denali National Park would be thrilled that the freshman of the year showed up because they always need help in the kitchen, right? And she said, no, get out. Come back in a couple of weeks. Stop back in. I said, you don't stop back in? What am I going to do? You don't know where you are, lady? I said, this is really far. And she's like, I don't care. Uh, next. And a guy heard me. He said, I've got a tent. I'll let you borrow my tent since the lodge is full and you're not an employee. And I said, great. Show me how to put up a tent because I have no idea what I'm doing here. And I uh, slept on top of everything, really uncomfortable. And I heard some laughter, you know, kind of early in the morning. Am I hike out? Yeah. And I'd open the flaps and it was just like, who the, what the, what? I know these aren't Brits. I don't know what they are, but they are not Brits. <laughs> <clears throat> and it turned out to be a couple of fantastic Aussies who had been traveling around quite a bit. And, and together we teamed up and we, we had a strategy for hitchhiking. Uh, by the way, if you're ever with three people, send one guy way ahead of you. And then, yeah. and then me and the other guy would be back further and, you know, stick our thumb out. In Alaska, it's practically law that they pick you up. And uh, wow. stuck our thumb out, thumb out and uh, got in the back with a bunch of dogs and a big pickup. And we're like, and then we catch up to our friend and we're, we're tapping through the window. Hey, mate, hey, mate, that's our friend. That's our friend. Pick him up, pick him up. <laughs> Boom, there it is. That's how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> She was learning a lot here. Yeah. I was, I was, I was, I was. I was the uh, the food, the meal ticket, and uh, and the uh, uh, ride bait. That's nice, what I was. good work. <laughs> yeah, we, had, we had a good system, man. What were you guys doing? Were you guys just cruising around at that stage then? And That's all we did, man, we just hitchhiked around. Um, wow. At this point, we caught we caught one one ride all the way up to Fairbanks, which is hundreds mm. of miles. We got one ride up to Fairbanks, which is a godforsaken town, and I don't recommend it. Sorry, guys, if you're listening out of Fairbanks, I'm sorry, but man, <laughs> it's just it's rough. <laughs> and uh, and it's cool, you know. What's cool about Alaska, guys, is that it'll never get ruined because permafrost keeps it that way. You cannot mm. really build. You can't even put pipes in under the houses in Fairbanks. Wow. And it, it'll never get destroyed by mankind anyway. Mm. Is that right up in the Arctic Circle? Up, that, ah, so no, I actually ended up uh, 60 miles above the Arctic Circle line in Coldfoot, Alaska. Uh, the Ice Truckers TV show is about that road that everybody takes when they're going up to Prudhoe Bay at the top of the world. Wow. Well, I was in Fairbanks and I was like, well, I think I need to start making some money. So I answered a job, pay phone, newspaper. Yeah, I'd like to be a banquet waitress. Sure. <laughs> I need to get up there. Okay. I'll get there as soon as I can. And I just went. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> and a forest ranger picked me up. But that's hundreds of miles again. Like one wow. way. There you go. It was awesome. It was awesome. I love wow. Alaska. That's I got to be to like you know, Tom Sawyer, man. It was great. What? Sorry. Uh, sorry. I was just saying that's the way to do it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. free will, just sort of go with it, hitchhike. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 And and Alaska, just interested in that. I mean, it must be such a different world when it's like in the Arctic Circle up there, and it's just like, yeah. Did you? I've always wanted to know. Have you? Did you eat some of that whale, like the fermented whale I um, did meat? Not. I did oh, not. Wow. What we had up there was the best halibut you've ever heard or had in your life, and mm. it is unbelievable. It's so good. So that's basically what we fed them. All these people would come in 250 miles like this on a bus. And these people would just be like, they'd still be moving at the dinner table. 
<laughs> the road is just a, it's a trucker road and they would stay wow. in, in a cold foot for the night in what i called a cardboard hotel with some black curtains because it's light all the time up there it's <laughs> not light all the time in anchorage but in, in that area it is mm. and we would feed them the best halibut they've ever had and then they'd go because <clears throat> the ride was rough and then off they'd go to uh to Pr prudhoe bay in the morning um, wow. But I did get, oh my God, I went exploring once and I should have known. I have no sense of direction at all. And we're like, yeah. hey, you know, you see that green hill up there? We're going to blow the wave to you from the top. Oh no. Oh no. I know. You remember as kids, we were scared of quicksand. Remember quicksand? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Imagine it, right? Uh huh. Tundra <laughs> is like quicksand. Do you no know it? Mm -hmm. wow. We came across tundra and tundra, it looks like grass, but it actually, as soon as you step in it, you sink. Oh, just wow. like quicksand. And we ended up in more tundra and we hadn't passed that on the way in. We were trying to go home. So we oh, ended wow. up in tundra and, and it was deep and it's Alaska. And so the mosquito is the national bird. I just assumed you know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It was horrible. It was just like everywhere, every step we, you know, thousands of mosquitoes are around us. And I learned real quick that you jump from, uh, from tree trunk to tree trunk so that you oh, have my God. for your feet to hang on to mm. how we got out i mean this was like johnny quest you know the the, <laughs> the cartoons from back in the day i mean this was my dream come true but at the same time i was scared to death and yeah. then we came across a, a river and we had to cross it and it was rushing and the only thing there was a beaver dam have you ever tried to cross a beaver dam <laughs> no <Nope>. don't <laughs> i'm laughing at my friend because he fell in you know he's like walking on top and i was like ah <laughs> Sides are muddy too. I got so, wow. oh my God. Wow. Those yeah. are real adventures though, Ed. Like, oh, it sounds no, like absolutely. I don't know how we made it back. By the grace of God, <laughs> I'm still here to tell the stories. So, I swear. Oh, wow. So, awesome. so, uh, so Alexis Ray, that has not always been your name actually. And um, maybe you want to tell us a little about the time you were babysitting uh, when you were 31 and hadn't heard from your parents again on your birthday. Yeah, sure, sure, mate. Um, I was so sad. It was uh, a month and a half, two months again. And I thought, yeah, you know, I'm so sick of being attached to this family. And I remembered a landmark case in which the uh, brother and sister were awarded sovereignty from, and, and they were underage. Uh, they were awarded sovereignty from their parents who were proven to be very abusive people. And, um, and I thought, well, maybe that's what I need to do, you know, sort of Metaphorically, I mean, you remember I started reading metaphysical stuff at 21. Here I was, you know, 10 years later, still hung up, still not like, you know, where's the oh, the bliss, you know, where's all that happy shit we're supposed to be feeling? I still wasn't there, and uh, so I thought, well, maybe I just need to. I, I know I'll, I'll just I'll divorce myself from my family, and I wrote out this divorce degree. I hereby divorce myself from the family, and I'm looking back at the house, hoping that the toddler doesn't wake up because you know the babysitter is by the fire pit crying and you know writing <laughs> stuff, and, ah, 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 you know. And I was like, well, what do people do now? Well, they burn shit. And I was like, okay, so I threw it in the fire, and I'm watching the curls edge, you know, the edges curl up around, you know, with the fire, and I thought, I don't feel any better. I, I've been through this process, but I don't feel any better. So uh, I, I, I then remembered the, there's a book called Mutant Message Down Under. And it was an American woman who ended up inadvertently on a walkabout in Australia. Wow. And uh, yeah, so the Aborigine will change their name based on the gifts that they have to bring to the tribe. So if you feel like you're a really good hunter, then that's your name good hunter you know <laughs> if you feel like you're an awesome seamstress your name's awesome seamstress <laughs> whatever you feel you bring to the tribe is your name that's your gift and that hit me at that moment when i was crying and i was watching those papers burn and i said you know i've always i i believe in that you know my i'm supposed to do something eventually if i ever stop crying um in life <laughs> you know uh and, and, and light is, is in the metaphysical world is light is information and as in enlighten, I guess, share information. And so I'd, I'd hated my last name. It was G I S like in Sam T gist, the <laughs> gist of the story and nobody could ever get it right ever. <laughs> I mean, it was such a pain in the ass last name. It meets the bottom line and that's really who I am. So that's still true. But it was a real bitch. I mean, I just hated it. Yeah. Anyway, I, I said, I'm going to choose Ray. R-A-Y, Ray. Yeah, that's information. Somehow, 
it, I, I had already done a little bit of public speaking. And so I knew the, the value in helping someone else, even just one step ahead of them, how that matters. And so I knew that whatever I could do, please, please, please make this all worth it. Please show me somehow, some way that I can turn all of this into something that will matter to somebody. And so Ray was easy to choose. And, and I said, if I ever had a daughter, I'd have named her Alexis. And so I went in the house and got a dictionary and I looked it up and it comes from Alexander the Great, meaning helper of mankind. Hmm. And I said, well, I might be a hot mess right now, but I hope I would become a helper of mankind someday. And so I thought, well, I'm going to name myself Alexis Ray. Now, here's the interesting part, though, is that a year and a half before that, I was in interviewing someone. Dr. Lee Poulos was a very bona fide paranormal parapsychologist who was helping the Canadian hockey team and people heal from cancer and all kinds of stuff. And he had muscle tested me, which, you know, muscle testing is when you stick out your arm and somebody can press on it with, you know, two fingers and it's really light pressure. But if, the, if it's something you're saying is not the truth, you can't resist them no matter what you try, right? Have you ever had that done? No, never. It sounds yeah. interesting. It's, it's ideal for testing for allergies. It's ideal for testing truths. Your body will tell you the truth. Hmm. Well, here I am. I'm so excited to meet this celebrity, right, for my radio show. And he says, well, let's test the, uh, the system, you know, with yeses and nos. Let's see where your yeses and nos are. So I stuck my arm and he goes and say your name. And I said my name, Lori Marie Gis. <laughs> my arm felt like a noodle. I said, no way. <laughs> let's do that again. And it, it happened two more times. And I said, I'm a little bit nervous about you, bro. Are you, you know, this doesn't make any sense at all. That's on my birth certificate. And he said, apparently, that's not your name. I don't know what else to tell you. So I made sure he was a call-in guest, not a visitor. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> really. Anyway, uh, long short of it is that that day at the fire pit, I wasn't thinking about Dr. Poulos telling me that Lori Marie Gist wasn't my name. That hmm. wasn't any. That wasn't even in my mind for years. Actually, I'd kind of blocked it out. Wow. And uh, yeah, so I ended up going to court and changing my name. That's Jeez. Yeah. Wow. That's that's fascinating. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is my parents have never asked. Oh, I take it back. My mom asked three years ago, why did you change your name? I couldn't tell her it's because it's, I have the same name as you. And every time you said my name, it was said with so much hatred. I couldn't stand my own self. Jeez. So I, I'm still taking care of her feelings a little bit. But I want to show you guys something. Can I, can I show you something? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I want to show you something that means yeah, a lot yeah. to me. Cool. Okay, so here we are, some, what, 31, 41, 51, 25 years after I've changed my name. <clears throat> Neither of my parents ever asked me why. I had a family nickname, Sissy, so it was easy to kind of skirt around it. But if I got a card in the mail, it would say Alexis. Hmm. But nobody ever asked me why. Well, this particular last time that I saw my mom, this was Christmas, she said, I got something for you. And it was the last one they had. And I'm really glad that I have it. And she gave me this mug. Now this hmm. mug has an A on it. Huh. Wow. That was my mom's way of acknowledging wow. that I that I changed cool. my name. Huh. Yeah. It, as much as she's a you know what? <laughs> <laughs> that means a lot to me. That meant yeah. a lot, yeah. Can That's imagine. a real gesture, isn't it? Of like it's a subtle yeah. way of just going cool, like that's your, that's who you are. I see you, kind of thing. Yeah, that's also probably why she blocked her number and moved away. She just can't stand <laughs> me. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> but uh, also talking about things that like happen later. I think there's you, you mentioned that your you've only told your brothers within the last three years that they're actually from different fathers. Is that right? It's true. Yeah, How it was a, it was a heavy burden, man. I carried it my whole life. I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know if it was true. I mean, I didn't know any, but later she said, yeah, I mean, I did know it was true. I mean, she'd said to me that it was in the books, medical books. She's in the medical books over it. Um, yeah. So I just happened to be hanging out with the littlest brother and I just out of the blue, I said, Matt, you know what? This is what happened. And he says, ah, oh, yeah, that's why now. And it made such a difference in his life. Here he was at 47, realizing finally why his dad doesn't treat him very well. He treats his brother pretty good, but not him. 
why he never felt like he fit in. He almost died as a baby. He was a preemie. And uh, he just never, ever felt like he was part of the family. And now it all made sense to him. So that was good. Wow. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Fascinating. Um, yeah. But uh, anyway, so talking about you, like, you know, you're still, you're still so full of energy now. And it's, it's hard to imagine that you speak about being depressed for 40 years and that mm-hmm. you were like basically a energy vampire. You kind of suck the air out of the room, you know, out of your mates and all that sort of thing. Actually, your best friend, I think, is actually even uh, quits on your relationship. Um, however, the thing is, you've always kept on going, right? Now, that yeah. takes some serious spirit. What has it been for you? You can't just lay down, you know? You can't just quit. I tried, you know? When I... Uh, when I took 20 sleeping pills and um, know that half of one would put me to sleep and I said, well, that's it. And I prepared my house and, and I, a note and I said, that's it. You know, um, I did. And I, and I wasn't scared. I, you know, I didn't run for, you know, for help. Um, I just said, okay. Cause this voice in me kept saying, just go ahead, just do it. You're going to die trying to do anything with your life. You're just going to die trying. This wasn't that long ago, guys um yeah so i still battle with that self-loathing i still battle with that um you're gonna die trying it's a life of futility i still battle with that i'm not always happy happy joy joy um but i did make it my goal a long time ago to someday some way somehow god this is far-fetched somebody call me happy go lucky somehow some way and, and that's a lofty fucking goal for a girl who was sad all the time I had these lines in my forehead when I was 15, younger even. And I remember sitting in a restaurant and a man came up and he said, what could possibly be so bad in your life? I was probably 14. And that you are, you are frowning like that, that you look so sad. And I said, man, you don't even know, man. You don't even know that every day I come home from school and I put my hand on the doorknob and the fear runs from my tailbone out my head because I never know what I'm going to walk into. Every day was like that. So by comparison, being able to get off on my own and finally figure out, okay, there's got to be something in the personal development and the metaphysical world opened up to me. And I said, well, your beliefs can change things. Uh, I'm pretty keen on that. Let me see what, <clears throat> let me see what beliefs I have now that, that aren't working. And that's when I invented some systems that worked. And that's what I do now wow. is I share those. Wow, Alexis. You know what? I think, um, yeah. A lot of people go through tough times, maybe not quite as insane as some of the stuff you've been through, but they still feel these these feelings. And so, you know, by you talking about it is actually very valuable. So like, what, what are the, some of the things you have done to just, you know, get yourself feeling better? And, and when you are seeing that those feelings are coming back, like what do you normally do? Or As early as, to, as, as recent as today, Craig, um, when I wrote, <clears throat> excuse me, I wrote something about, anyway, it was something a bit derogatory or, or ne- it wasn't negative, but I was kind of down on myself for a minute. Mm-hmm. And there was this part of me that reared its head up and, and it started, I started to crumble. I literally had to pull back. I literally got up from this desk. This was today. I got up from this desk and I walked away and I said, don't do that to yourself. Don't do that again. Don't Mm -hmm. do that again. Because it's so fucking automatic pilot to just, Mm -hmm. "Ah." because in the household that I was raised in, I, you know, can you imagine somebody just, you know, knuckle sandwiching you and then you're not allowed to cry. You're not allowed to be mad. You're not allowed to feel just get away from, get away from me. Just completely. So the only place for all that energy to go is at yourself. And, and these narcissistic bullies that I was raised by, and I'm grateful at the time, now I am for, for the person I've become, but mm, it wasn't without work. Um, you turn it on yourself is what you do because there's no other place to channel that energy. None. And they'll have you believing that it's all your fault. How many times I heard, if it wasn't for you goddamn kids, what mom, your life would be great? That, mm. it was, I'm sorry yeah. I was born. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was rough. Yeah. So what I do, what I, uh, what do I do? Um, so today, recently today I had, I had, it was almost like straight jacketing my emotional process. It wanted to immediately turn itself on me and, and tear myself apart. 
And I, and I literally out loud was saying, don't do that, don't do that. It's hard. Mm. It's really hard. When your habit to hate yourself is so entrenched, it's mm. hard. Wow, I'm so sorry, and it's those patterns. Wow, it's really hard. I had somebody give me a reading earlier this year, and she um she was saying some things that I didn't really register. In fact, both of us at one point said. Jesus, am I reading the right person's chart? <laughs> I, said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. None of it felt true. But one of the things that she said, and I'd really like to share this with your audience, and it meant everything because it explained it like me telling my little brother, Maurice is not your dad. That's why he's so mean to you. Um, was, uh, she said, there's an alignment that I was born under that has a propensity for self-loathing. So um, how nice that I chose parents that were so bad, so narcissistic, so bullet, so bad. On top of everything else, my spirit must have wanted to have one hell of a climb straight the hell up, out of a dark hole, to reset, to do something, to do some kind of rebalance, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she named it and she said, yeah, it's because this and this and this are aligned, and that's your challenge this time. I went, oh my God, thank you for telling me. <laughs> At least now I know why this is so hard to do mm. all the time. It wow. is. And it runs. It makes Go ahead. No, no, sorry. No, it just flies in the face of all the confidence I have. I have complete and utter confidence. I have no doubts in myself at all. I know what I'm capable of. I know what I'm good at. I, I know I have a lot of, none of it matters in that moment when this switch happens and this voice comes in and says, oh, you're doomed. You know, it just doesn't matter. There is no, oh my God, there's no stopping it. But there has to be a way, and that's what I do. that's what I do now. Is I'm just like, no, you don't you don't get to say this to me anymore, mm. and it takes a lot of effort. But I get wow. it. Wow, mm. nip it in the bud. What, what do you <laughs> what do you say to people? I was reading something recently, and they they were talking about happiness being a choice and a skill. What do you say to people that say that? Um, I I have been recorded as saying that happiness is a head trip. And uh, it really has everything to do with what, what you, you know, how you perceive the world. Um, I was tested a couple of times just to make sure that it wasn't chemical imbalance. Um, mm. I wanted it to be, believe me, I wanted to be able to just take a pill and get rid of all that sadness. Uh, God, if it only could have been easier. Um, so barring that, barring, barring a chemical imbalance, the concept of happiness, I think it, it depends on how you define it, Craig. Mm. If, if, you know, if everything needs to be perfect and no problems, then you're screwed because that's not life. True. So what I made was a goal to be happy for no apparent reason in spite of present circumstances. And what that really means is that there's a joy inside that that pr prevails. It doesn't matter, and that that's a hell of a hill to be on top of. But you can get there. Oh, thanks for that, Craig. Craig and I were actually talking about happiness and stuff this morning because mm. uh, we just yeah we 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 yeah we're kind of also like exploring this idea around happiness and life and like you know what it means and all these things. Um, and we basically were like you know if we all understood that life is actually difficult, right? Life is a challenge. Okay, that, That's actually the base, right? That's where we all begin. It's a challenge. It's difficult. It's hard. It's not the, the happy, whatever, like that some people sort of uh, make it out to be. But what happens, how you deal with life, how you deal with the difficult difficulties, how you deal with the challenges, right? The, 
the reward is happiness, right? Yes. yes. How, that is the reward. Happiness is the reward. Yes. So basically the effort you put into life, right? is basically your happiness is going to be your reward. And uh, yeah, I don't know. We kind of like that sort of theory and kind of sort of makes a lot of sense to us. Hey, Craig, guys. hundred percent. And, and having pe- just off the back of that, like a, a sense of sort of peace, not necessarily, like you said, how do you define happiness, Alexis? Like that's, that's a really good point. You know, like as Gareth said, you know, getting through tough times is a, is a sense of achievement. That's a form of happiness, but you know, looking for these highs that a lot of people want and, and search for um, is sort of a false sense of, of real life. So having mm-hmm. a sense of peace through good and bad times is really like probably where it's at, you know? And what, to answer your Craig, uh, you, uh, your question, Craig, it, it, it really is about, it's a process of um, how, how you process what's happening. Um, what, when things come at you, I mean, I, I, I still keep the Super Bowl around to remind me that the harder that this puppy gets thrown down, the higher it goes back up, doesn't it? Like right? It. Yeah. So resilience. <clears throat> the other thing, and I have a little treat for you guys, is um, that when something comes along, how we receive it is how we perceive it. Yeah? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Like so, so when troubles show up, see that? Oh. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> I like that. I keep that above my desk so that when when the chips fall, I can look up at it and go, oh, okay. Because acceptance is the key to peace. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. It's kind of a You're, good philosophy on life, yeah. man. Yeah, I like that's, that's for sure. <laughs> acceptance, as you say, you know, that's very, very true. Like your circumstances are your circumstances right yeah. now. And yeah, yeah self acceptance is so important. So mm-hmm. just. Um, I mean, just talking about how you've had some really tough times. And, and one of the other things was also you lived in, in, a, in sort of women's uh, and homeless shelters. Um, I mean, how, how, how did you end up in a, in a space like that? There were, um, there were occasions where a series of choices led to me needing some, some protection. Um, what happened? Um, first of all, let me explain something. Back in the day, when um, when I would have a, a, a you know pretty much a sheer and utter collapse, um, and would end up in a in a ward for observation, um, because if a per- person threatens to hurt themselves, uh, whether they mean it or not, it's automatic. You get three days. It's automatic. And it was the first time, as jacked up as this is going to sound. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe this will make sense. It was the first time that I actually felt like somebody was there for me and I lit and I got to sleep and I, and somebody made, you know, I was taken care of and yes, I was in a psych ward for observation and they realized, you know, they did tests and I don't need to have medication and there was conversation and you just need to get emotionally better. And I was, but I felt cared for for the first time that I can remember as a grown up, and, mm -hmm, and, and as a, as it would happen to be, I got involved in, in, uh, in drugs and in, especially in crack. Um, a friend introduced me to it. I stayed away from it for five years and then somebody else introduced me to it. And then I was in, I was in for, for a while. And, um, I was into the point where I lost my house because I wasn't working. Um, I was living with the dealer and he turned violent and Mm -hmm. I, was running away from him and jumped over, climbed up a fence. And when I jumped down, I broke my foot Hmm. and uh, I had nowhere to go. So I was in a women's shelter that time. Um, And so they took care of me. Like it was, it was amazing. I really felt cared for, for once. I I felt like I, I found other women that, that I wasn't, I wasn't alone for once feeling so bad you know just just it was kind of nuts um but then there was another time when I ended up in a homeless shelter and this was co-ed and they let you stay for a little while um so then you kind of got to figure out what to do so I've had a couple of instances like that yeah Hmm. wow well, you certainly have uh, come through a lot, that's for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. It's actually very, it's very inspiring to see where you are now in life. So, so you know, 
uh, keep keep doing amazing things and keep smiling and and laughing because it's infectious i promise you <laughs> thank you <laughs> so, thank you so you've been the creative producer and host of like radio talk shows um amongst them have been some interesting ones by the sounds of it that's for sure the yes. <laughs> and alexa show so that's one of them um which is the world's first uncensored adult talk station uh, on the web uh, yes. talk radio which also sounds really interesting so oh, <laughs> maybe you just delve a little bit into those sure absolutely um so what's pretty cool about um even if just just a, a Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. So I ended up on the Tyra Banks show. I wanted to throw that in there because it has everything to do with being homeless. Believe it or not. Yeah. 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 Um, th there was an ad on Craigslist that was about, um, I hope I haven't thrown you off too much bringing this up right now, but it's, no, no. it's funny how life works out guys. Um, there was an ad on Craigslist and it said, would you like to be on a national talk show? We're looking for people that have been putting this off, but they really need to do it. It's a live HIV test with Tyra Banks, you know. I was like, wow. yeah, okay. They didn't say it was with Tyra. They just and, I, I, and they said, "Tell us why." Right in your story, and I said, "Okay." Well, it turned out that one of the people from the homeless shelter, uh, he and I took a shine to each other, and later on, it, uh, people said, "You know what? He's still he's still using, and he's also sharing needles, mm. and you're having unprotected sex with them. So you might wow. want to know about that." Oh, so wow. I was scared. I needed, I, I needed to get the test and I didn't want to. I mean, who the hell wants to really get Goodness. that answer, right? Of course. Yeah. So that's how I ended up on Tyra. Um, <laughs> doing a swab test with Tyra Banks. Bold. I don't know what that is. Bold. I don't know. But anyway, Cougar Talk Radio was, uh, was a cocktail party uh, <laughs> going into production, really. The, the women were just nee -nee 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 about men. And I said... Uh, cause I'm Jones and I, I need to have a show in my life. That's just how I am. And I was like, ah, I hear another show coming up and, <laughs> and, uh, and it turned out that, uh, none of them wanted to be on the show with me, but that was fine. Uh, it turned out to, it, and so, so the title Cougar Talk, it was not about older women getting younger guys. It, it was the <laughs> guy, you know, I love taglines, headlines and marketing, right? So I liked the title. It was compelling. Cougar Talk Radio was not a sports show either, but it could have been because it <laughs> was like a dating show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a comedy show for anybody who's ever been single. I swear it was, it was the Charleston dating scene is just hideous. And I, I, I wasn't in, I was kind of involved in it, which is how I ended up on the Steve Harvey show too. But anyway, wow. um, it was <laughs> so bad. And I had all these guests and a bottle of champagne every Sunday. We were just, woohoo! Yeah, let's talk about dating. <laughs> <laughs> antics were hysterical. So, uh, and then the other one, ksdxradio.com, um, two hours, it was my first paid gig. So uh, two hours a day, five days a week. And this was still, this was before the word podcast was invented. It was still called internet talk radio. And nobody <laughs> even knew it happened. Nobody knew we were there. And it was really frustrating because I was, I was a dancer. I was an adult entertainer. Okay. I was like, I got some high heels, man. Why don't we put some camera on my legs or something? Come on. Can't we draw some kind of attention in here? <laughs> Come on, and man. So, we need a so caller. <laughs> So you were frustrated because like the, you were behind the mic and the, the, you weren't on camera. <laughs> well, it wasn't that I wasn't on camera. It's that we had no callers. We had no business. We had mm. nothing. And I didn't understand what this guy was doing. Some, some investor out of Texas, what he was doing was building up the brand so he could sell it. It ended up mm. becoming a, a porn stars like talk show website. But at the time, we didn't know that. We're just, you know, and Big Dick, Jesus, God, the guy had the sense of humor of a nine-year-old. And, and he was just an idiot. <laughs> he contributed nothing. But I learned, let's see, by then, that was my third show. Yeah, that was my third show. So I learned, uh, I love interviewing people. And so I was interviewing porn stars and authors. And I went to the LA um, Adult Film Industry Awards, met Larry Flynn, Jenna Jameson, the whole thing. You know, I had my wow. little look going on, my long blonde hair. <laughs> but whatever <laughs> it was a lot of fun but it was it was i was desperate for content you know because he would guffaw once in a while at like you know an armpit joke or something but he was a terrible co-host <laughs> and uh yeah uh the um 
the station then was sold again overnight. Gone. Gone. Wow. It happens all the time. Wow. Yeah. So what happened to you when it was sold? That was the end of that gig? Or? That was the end of that gig. Uh, I still had a regular job working for um, somebody who was smart enough to get into the adult industry way, way, way early. He had amateur websites way early. I have seen everything, y'all. I have been part <laughs> of so many conversations. I have been in dungeons. I have been, I have been yeah. everywhere, man. I have seen it all. And As part, part of the of radio my, show or just? Uh, uh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> 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 so there must be something that you've seen that's kind of like you know taken your breath away or you know made you go whoa that's kind of weird made you blush <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh a lot of it did i'm i you know i don't just i i mean i, I come up, if you saw me in a grocery store you'd probably think you know i just left the library you know i can look pretty conservative <laughs> um and kind of i am you know but uh i'd had a reading and this and this uh, particular astrologer said hey uh you've got to rebalance something that happened in a recent lifetime ago. I said, is that why I cry? You know, when I get my butt massage, and he goes, yeah, because your body remembers that and you need to go figure it out because that you died. There was some damage done to your body and you died in a recent mm -hmm. lifetime ago. And I'm like, cool, dude. I'm glad to know my, my massage therapist will be glad to know too, because it's my neck that hurts, but my <laughs> butt, when he rubs it, I cry. It makes no sense wow. at all. Right. None. None. <laughs> right. And it's like, let me find out why. And he says, well, you're just going to have to go balance out that imbalance of power. Okay. So uh, that led me to um, a personal ad I answered. And that led me to discover uh, BDSM. Hmm. Do you guys know what that is? BDSM? Yeah. yeah, you yeah. both are nodding. For those of you <laughs> who don't have video, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so quietly nodding very, very simply. <laughs> um, so I, I, as a result of, of, of that exposure, if you will, um, I had a boyfriend who wanted to have a mistress and I uh, found myself walking him in his hood with a chain around his neck and a collar and a lead to go to a fetish party. Uh, yeah, <laughs> in my high heel leather stiletto. I love those boots, boy, those are <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> there isn't wow. much I haven't seen. Um, and, and as a result of that exposure, um, recently, I've opened up my and specifically made my marketing for, for people that are looking to tell their story. I've literally geared it towards those that are dealing with transgender or identity issues or homelessness or addiction or anything that, that people, mostly people go, ooh, you need that? And, and invite them to come forward because I really, really get it. I really do. And I'm so excited to be able to give them like that acceptance that like, you're into this, I'm okay with that. Whatever your thing is, I don't care. I'll give you makeup tips if you wanna cross dress. I mean, come on. And that was my job at the uh, at this particular website developer's place was to take all the photos that came in and resell them. I was a telemarketer for soft porn. <laughs> right crazy wow there's a lot of <laughs> chicks on the beach in california that are not chicks <laughs> uh, <laughs> really? Really? wow i'm telling you <laughs> see it all oh, all good wow. tips to know <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah even a package check's not going to tell you that one wow <laughs> seriously mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> well, so, perfect host but, for that ksex radio but anyway go ahead but it's amazing that like i think you know there is more and more of a movement of like things are not taboo but on some it's so weird because you've got both ends of the spectrum like everything is taboo these days on one hand and on the other hand like more and more and more it's like more embracing the world but you have to be so careful what you say and stuff so it's it's kind of this weird time that we live in isn't it because yes this, like, yes so stupid yeah, that's why I love the uh, the latest um, episodes of um, the Fab Five Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, because there, there's so many messages in there about, you know what, that's that old Christian stuff or whatever people are hung up on. That's not who we are. That's not what the Bible says to do. I'm not a Bible quoter, guys. I'm just all about love. And that's the summary of my whole thing. We're all one and it's all good. And it's nice. about time we just start, started treating each other like we are in this together, yo. Don't act like it, you know? yeah totally totally yeah <laughs> so it's like nothing to do anymore like it's so ridiculous how people get into their little bubbles isn't it and uh yes. yeah 
just crazy. So, um, I mean, you'd been through so much by this stage in your life, Alexis, and um, uh, you actually, you know, you mentioned, you know, t- smoking crack and things like that. But there was also a mir- bit of a miraculous turnaround with a, a call from Australia. <laughs> yes, there was. It's, it's so funny. It's a nice setup you did there, Craig. Here's what happened. Um, it was uh, it was on the tail end of the um, the 08, you know, crisis. And here was 09. And I honestly couldn't find a job more than four hours a day, driving cars through a car auction or whatever. It wasn't a lot of pay. Every bit of money I had was going to buy a rock. Because I knew, I mean, I've been in the ghetto. I've been in the alleys. I've been everywhere, man. And it wasn't hard for me to go find something. And that was, it was a temporary Band-Aid. And I knew it, but I didn't have a lot of money. It was the only source of fun I had. And I could see it was, you know, freight train heading for a wall. Um, Because this would have been year five, maybe, into into being a total head, you know. Could I work? Yeah, yeah. But there were times I didn't. Anyhow, the long and short of it is, I said to whoever listens, God help me. I've got to get out of here. I was in downtown Denver. It was far too easy to find people. Um, I really needed to get out. And then the phone rang. <laughs> well, not quite that, not quite that quickly, but I got a landline at, with, for the first time in a decade. And the phone rang and there was a long pause, like a telemarketer. And I was ready to hang up. And I hear, uh, uh, Alexis, uh, don't hang up. It's Alex. And I was like, what do you want? I tried to ditch you 10 years ago. This was the guy I walked down the street in the hood. <laughs> No way. <laughs> yeah, the chiropractor. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> I said, because he never st- he never got over a crush. He never got over that I didn't uh. want to be his mistress forever. Huh. Anyway, he said, I really need your help. And within five days, I was gone. Wow. Went down to Australia. Yeah. Jeez. Sure. Yeah. And you lost it there. How long were you there for? So I was there the limit of the tourist visa. Um, and it was extended. So about a year and a half, maybe. And uh-huh. then uh, we applied for a visa, which I was right on the edge of, uh, of the cutoff. Australia cuts you off at 47 to, to uh, apply for a visa and, mm. or 46. And um, <clears throat> I applied and then I had to go. Hmm. So hmm. I came back to the U.S. never expecting it to fly. And uh, it did. So I came back, I went back to Queensland. Wow. Crazy. six flights man it's it's yeah. four meals three movies and two naps <laughs> i know it by That's now <laughs> uh, measure your length of the flights and <laughs> i like that <laughs> there's nothing like movies on an airplane i reckon that must be one of my most enjoyable things ever i swear like <laughs> Me too. i don't know what it is you literally no distractions yeah you have full permission awesome. to Mm. Stay awake for as long as you want and watch whatever you want. It's awesome. <laughs> totally. I almost don't like the idea of having Wi-Fi on planes these days because, you know, you, before you just, you have to switch everything off. You just yes. there yeah. and, you know, so like yes. a bit nervous about this. <laughs> yeah, yes. for sure. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, we, we focused, I guess, a lot on the the tough times. But you, you know, it's been a lot of fun <laughs> focusing on those anyway. Um, but you're a true warrior of a lady, to to be honest with you. And um, you know, it's it's just so nice to to see you smiling and that. So, what was the what was the turning point uh, for you, like that actually changed everything to get you back on your two feet again? It's an exercise that I put everybody through. And thanks for asking. It's so simple to do. And it started with an inventory on a piece of paper where you write the words, I believe. And line by line by line for, I don't know, three or four months, I wrote down everything that I thought, every freaking thought. And I was able to suss out the ones that were silly or didn't make sense or they maybe maybe made sense a long time ago, but they don't anymore. And uh, that's where I've come up with, because of that, um, being able to sort of pull stuff out and go, I don't need that. I, don't, not, I thought all businessmen were spiritually shallow. And then I interviewed hundreds of CEOs and I was like, that's got to go. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> but what I've learned is that, you know, through awareness and acceptance and action comes change. And so through awareness, immense awareness of what's really running me, and then deciding to replace it or like kind of like firing the old guard to bring in some new guard um, has really helped 
but there's also some techniques and I cannot say enough for the technique called tapping. Mm. Tapping uh, or if emotional freedom technique. Back in the day, uh, do you, are you aware of what tapping is? No, Gary? I'd love to know. No, yeah. yeah, please go into it. So it's based on, uh, you, you would love this, Gareth. It's um, Chinese medicine based on the acupressure points in our system. And when you have a thought, uh, it has a thought field. It, this was originally called thought field therapy or TFT. And it was developed by Dr. Callahan. Dr. Callahan was a practicing psychologist in LA. And uh, so he had a pretty, really, you know, he had like lively practice. He's in LA, he's in Hollywood, you know, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, he started to, to realize that, that there's an energy system associated with every thought. And that if, and that if, he, um, if he sort of stimulated a, a body pressure point, well, the long and short of it is he had a patient uh, who was had a phobia, water phobia. Now phobias are de determined, are defined by something that doesn't make any sense at all. There's no past, there's no reasoning, there's no memory. A phobia is something from somewhere else. And people have phobias. Well, this woman, this poor woman, Mary, was debilitated with a water phobia. I mean, she couldn't take a bath. What, uh, bodies of water, even on the television, would cause her immense anxiety. And as a psychologist, Dr. Callahan was, you know, really confounded. How do I help somebody with a phobia? And so this one particular day, he said, Mary, I want you to think about water. And she's like, oh, no, Doc, uh, where do you feel it, Mary? Right here in my stomach, right here in my stomach. He said, Mary, I want you to tap right here under, the, under your eye. I want you to tap right here. This is the point for that. And she's tapping as she's thinking about the water and some other points along her face and her hands. And the next thing he knows, <clears throat> she gets up and she runs out the back door because he's pr practicing at home and gets in the pool. She got in the pool and, and he's like, wait, <laughs> wait, <laughs> don't worry, doc. I know I can't swim, but look, I'm not afraid. <laughs> and this is the first case in which Dr. Callahan was, to, was able to apply the Chinese acupressure system and understand that every thought has an energy system. And in that, if there is an emotional reaction of some kind, there's a blowout in the energy system and it's called a perturbation. That's where perturbed comes from. Makes mm. sense to me, right? Mm. So tapping while you're thinking of a certain thing, it's like these points here. Tapping is like, emo uh, I call it uh, fix a flat for emotional blowouts. <laughs> tapping mm. is amazing. Mm. I did it with a woman in the uh, in the homeless shelter, and this this women's shelter, this little Asian, and and uh, I taught them all how to do it. Everywhere I went, I'm trying to help. <laughs> you know, as I dry my own eyes, I'm like, here, let me help you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> anyway, a couple of days later, she comes up to me. She looks up at me. And she goes, and she has bruises on on these points on her face. She has bruises. And I said, what are you doing? She says, oh, I have a lot of issues. I have a lot of issues. I feel much better, much better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <classic. laughs> I said, you got to take it easy on the tapping part. The tapping is going crazy. <laughs> oh, funny. Classic. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> body talk. There's a, a system called body talk, which was quite famous in south africa actually oh. um yeah very well and probably based on exactly the same so he was the originator of that of that technique yeah to get back to that story i'd read about it in the newspaper and went to a class on it you know i went and I experienced it and this woman took me through the process and what happens is you rate your feeling your amount of stress from a zero nothing to a ten and my feelings at that time were like on this particular thought were a 10, probably 12. And, and we just keep doing the routine, doing the routine, doing the routine until eventually you have the same thought and there is no emotional upset whatsoever. You can still remember the thought, but there is no emotional attachment at all. It's amazing. And it works like gravity, whether you believe in it or not, it works anyway. So I had this experience and I'm the only lay person in the class and I don't care. I need, God dang it, I'm going to feel better, you know, I want to feel better, so yeah, so then at that time, the book was, the manual was easily that big, Dr. Callahan, excuse me, had discovered a process 
of a unique nature. These are all like recipes for this, you know, for addiction or for, you know, for, for loss of a loved one. He had it all broken down. It was amazing. But then he got two students in there and they, they, they got smart or smarter or somehow they streamlined it and the, it became known as EFT or emotional freedom mm -hmm. technique. And there is a singular treatment. You can find it on YouTube now in which you can use to help alleviate so much of the stress that comes associated with the thought. So you don't get stuck in it. You don't get stuck in the spiral because we have to feel what we want to feel, right? You have to go through it to get over it. The trick is not to get stuck in it. Mm. Hard Very true. So do you teach a few of these things to how to people just you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Anything I can share, Craig, anything I can give that, that work for me, yeah, you know, probably the next thing that I would recommend is EMDR, and that's not something I'm qualified to do, but uh, EMDR works real well too. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you you're doing so much in your life, and uh, you you now speak, and you're talking about you know helping others in in any way that you can. You work as a coach. Uh, you also work as a branding specialist, and you host a, f a few new podcasts, which is really cool. Um, yeah. So life is is good and it's busy. Um, how does it all feel when you kind of look back on it all? Um, exactly right. It feels great. Um, I really uh, have have come to the point where I've um, adopted a philosophy about why bad shit happens. And I was literally able to stand at my table the other day, like literally my house hears a lot of rants and raves because there's nobody else but me. So they're just like, and I'm just like literally applauding my mother. Congratulations. You were the biggest fucking bitch you could have been. You did such a good job. I'm so impressed. You know, like, yeah, because I adopted this idea that, you know, we agreed somewhere there was a pre-birth conversation and Robert Schwartz is an amazing person to, to learn from about that pre-birth conversation about things that we decided we would do before we got here and that we would help each other with. And some of them aren't very nice things. And yet that person is providing a gift. And so um, that level of freedom, genuinely a freed spirit now um, is, is that there isn't any kind of angst or, you know, whatever. So if I can pass that on to people and I know I can, um, I'm so excited. Uh, the midlife my ass tour, <laughs> midlife I'm, my ass. I'm just getting started. Yeah, that's <laughs> gonna be a thing. That's gonna be a thing. It's gonna be a show. I'm so excited to do that um, and to help people to untie their cement shoes so they can get up in a hot air balloon ride equivalent to them. I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's so important, isn't it? Like, yeah. it's amazing how many people let stuff hold them back in life. Like, just yeah. like. I just get over it. I mean, I know, I know it's easier said than done, but in some instances it literally is like, you must just get over it now. Like, like forget about it because it's actually really um, being detrimental to, you know, your future self. And uh, yeah, I guess that's why we need people like you to, to teach others and uh, show them how to do it basically. So thank you. Yeah. Gareth. I, I have a website. Uh, I haven't developed it, but it's forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's also midlifebyass.com so you know really because honestly at some point there's there's this inner turmoil that happens it's like how bad does it have to get people how mm -hmm. much you know angst do you want to feel how how much irritation lack of sleep uh irritability you know how bad does it have to get before you finally go okay i put my wall my ladder on the wrong career wall or I've, you know, I'm in a situation that could be better, whatever it is, just do something about it. Mm, for sure. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. And, and one of the other things that you do, which, which we obviously love because it makes, I guess, our job easier is that you teach people how to be good yeah. guests on podcasts. Yeah. So what are your, I guess, your, your ingredients, like maybe your top three or what, what sort of stands out for you the most of being a good guest? Thank you for asking that one. I'm so passionate about that because there's nothing worse than a great story that has to be, that is waiting to be told and the messenger doesn't, doesn't know how to deliver it. And, mm -hmm. and actually that matters. That, that genuinely matters to me. So uh, it's clarity of message, you know, it's, it's, it's really clarity, guys, you have to really know what it is that you came to say, not just la 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 la, and then I went and I picked some flowers, and then I put them in a glass of water, 
like, really? Come on, you know? Mm. So I really help people to get clear and uh, shorten it down, you know. Um, but when, when you're on a show, <clears throat> hopefully I have uh, been an example of this, <laughs> but to answer the freaking question and then stop talking. <laughs> Just a concept. Go. I don't know. There's, that's a, actually a really key point. And what I found, Gareth, is that when I interview newbies, they never stop talking. Mm-hmm. We, know just... <laughs> we know that. We know all too well. <laughs> all too well. It's amazing. Yeah. It's a, it really is an art to be a, a good guest, as it is an art to be a good uh, host and interviewer. Yeah. You know, and you and you really need to to practice these things and, and to find out what the good techniques and everything are like, you know, whichever side of the microphone you're on. The other thing that I, um, I've just coined the term, uh, paintbrush words, hmm. um, being able to, to, to paint a picture, hmm. um, you know, our tone is 38% of our communication. And, and being able to, to vary your communication, your intonations, your, your uh, cadence, you know, mm. the, those delivery styles, because the majority of podcasts are delivered on audio only. There's no privilege of seeing the tears that ran down my face or the laughter or the smile on yours. You know, there's no, there's no, you can't see that. So what we have now then is a requirement, if you will, for an extremely good storyteller. Someone who mm. wants, who makes you want to lean in and listen and then brings you back through it, just like a, a, a dream weaver. And, the, and they, and they kind of carry you along and then they take you and land you in this place that's safe. And it's storytelling and story weaving. And it's done with words that make you picture what it is that they're talking about. Because if you don't, you're going to lose that audience the host will look bad, the guests will look bad, and nobody's going to benefit. And that's a shame because that's a waste of a story. Mm. I like what yeah. you did there. <laughs> yeah. That was good. Wow. Yeah, that was really like good. A moment yeah. to appreciate you, that. Yeah. yeah, you didn't even have to like talk. You just, yeah, you know what I mean? It's just like, your and it's just so amazing. It's, <laughs> there's so much like you, like you, you sort of um, alluding to it, Gareth. There's like a lot of power in silence sometimes too, and and pauses, which is which is often awkward and tough in the moment, but it really works, doesn't it? And it's like, yeah, just, just learning to be clear on your message is, is such a, so important before you be interviewed. So, so thanks for sharing those with us. Um, yeah. But talk, you know, talking about telling one story um, yeah. and, how, you know, why is it actually um, so important for people to tell their story and, and how has it helped you? I appreciate that love. Um, the most significant, one of the most significant moments in my life was a, th- a therapist whose, whose attention um, changed my entire being. For once, I didn't feel crazy. And he acknowledged, accepted, and, um, and uh, sort of was compassionate, I guess. So uh, being heard is amazing. Being understood is incredible being accepted is transformative and often that's all it takes maybe a person only has to tell their story once and that's enough maybe it's more but for both the listener and the speaker everyone is transformed Mm. because vocalizing that story and i say we've all got a story and that we've literally lived to tell about it literally lived to tell about it Uh, i i cannot mean that any bigger and it, um, so what happens is uh, the sharing of that is honest to God, the source of all fulfillment, <laughs> because mm-hmm. you're giving back the thing that you came to give that you cultivated so freaking hard to have, and you can't give it away if you don't own it first. So there's the process for the speaker. They have to own what they have. You have to own it to give it. And when you share it, you get more. <laughs> now look at that, right? Mm-hmm. That's so ironic. I think I've heard it uh, explained better before. That's for sure. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, Yeah, I mean, we just find that it's just so powerful to actually tell your own story, you know, and and we we really encourage every single person in the world to tell their own story um, because it's twofold. 
it's actually quite cathartic in one sort of way, you know, like yeah. speaking about what you've done. It's nice remembering things that have happened as well. But then it's also good for other people to get to know you better. And it's just amazing. Like, uh, you know, we actually interviewed each other not too long ago. And it was so cool because, you know, it was good for us each because we actually wrote, you think your storyboard was long. We wrote like 11 pages <laughs> each. <laughs> it was almost like a <laughs> journal that we did for each other. But, um, but then, it, so that was cool. But then also just for like people that we'd been to school with and whatever, like they, it's amazing how many people reached out to us and they're like, wow, I didn't really know that about you. Or that was so cool or jeepers, you know, like I remember that at school and it was funny and, um, it's just, we Aww. really, we really encourage everyone to, to tell their story and also to like, especially to your mates, cause you think, you know, your friends, but actually you don't, you don't really, really know them a, a lot of the time no, you and don't. your fam and your family as well. Like, you know, like you don't always know like what about your parents upbringing and whatever. And even like while you were, you know, growing up with them, you don't necessarily know a hell of a lot of stuff. So, you know, if you have that sort of relationship, it's really worth actually going and exploring their stories more too. Mm. And, like, and like you've said as well, that being listened to and just being totally heard um, in a sort of an interview fashion is also very powerful. You know, it's just, it feels really good and it's, uh, it's just a great feeling, isn't it? So there's so much good that comes from, from these kinds of conversations that, that, that you're having and that we're having and that kind of thing. In the, in the era of dis, disconnectivity in a world that's more connected than ever, but is more impersonal than ever, um, right? This is an opportunity to become basically a bedside mate with somebody that you wouldn't normally ever get to listen to on an extensive level. The interviews mm -hmm. you guys do, the depth that you go to with the people that you feature, what a privilege. In the past, the only thing we could do to get close to, close to someone like that was to buy their cassette series or maybe catch them on a show. And now we've got this opportunity to hear, you know, kind of like back in the day when um, Paul Harvey would say, and now for the rest of the story. That's why it's important. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's super important. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to, I guess we, we haven't got a hell of a lot of time left with you. Um, and it's just been like amazing speaking to you and, you know, hearing your story and, you know, uh, just sort of, you know, um, listening and like feeling your energy. And it's just, it's just really, really amazing. <laughs> so, um, it's a one woman show. Huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Week. yeah da, 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 exactly, exactly. So, so, <laughs> So just before we do like sort of finish off, cause we have a couple of questions you asked at the end. Like, I was just wondering, like, you know, I guess there's many, many ladies that, you know, are uh, suffering is not the right word, but you like we go through midlife crisis, not just ladies, but men too, you know, lots, you know, every, all of us, yeah. what kind of advice do you have for people in that sort of phase of their life? So, um, that's a great question. Uh, there is a phenomenon uh, from, if you can think back to 28 to 31, there was an era of really big change for all of us. And, and looking forward, it was like, what am I doing with the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. You know, it's really intense, right? That's because there was this thing going on called the Saturn return. And it takes two or three years. Saturn return is really intense. And it makes us question where we're, who we are, what we're about. And you're so young. You don't know that you're that young when you're that young. Until you look back and go, God, I was young. Yeah. <laughs> you <know? That's> true. <laughs> but anyway, what happens is it comes back again. It comes back again. 29 and a half years later, Saturn return mm. happens again. So this idea that midlife crisis, midlife crisis, that's a term that came up. And it was, and it's, it was supposedly around the age of 40 because people were living to be 80. So, okay. The, I think the crisis part could be avoided if we made choices better back in the third, when we're 30 and made choices based uh, as we went along based on what I call the big yes. And that's that thing that defies logic, but it looks, it looks crazy to other people, but you know what? It's actually where you're supposed to be, where you're supposed to go. If I said, do you want to go to a party? And you'd be like, eh, not so much. You might what backpedal fib. I got appointments. Nah, nah, nah. All you can do in the future is you could say, I'm not getting a big yes on that. And I'd be like, cool. No worries. 
Um, yeah. So following the big yes is that feeling, that thing that pushes, that pulls, that says, I'm your still small voice. Come on, this way, this way. <laughs> and you listen to it, right? You know, if you listen to it, then you're not going to have a crisis later. So I'm just saying about that part. But as far as it goes in midlife, you know, the, the concept about it is, is a, a reassessment. Well, it's also one of the phenomenons about it is that uh, you, all the things that you accumulated, whether it's beliefs or a bunch of really bad hats or a lot of shoes or some really shitty people in your life, all of it, all of it goes, it goes. And, 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 and you're, you're then your, 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 your period of accumulation is now the opposite. You're uncluttering your mind, you're uncluttering your world, you're looking at what's next. And the, and the interesting part now is that we have people living three decades longer than they used to. That's a mm -hmm. long time. So what that means is we now have an area of life in which people don't even know what to do with themselves. They, they, they expected to retire at 55 or 60. I can't even imagine that now. But, but now they've got all this time. And what are they going to do with themselves? Well, hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully, you know, they'll find their way to the global microphone and, uh, and share their story and, and learn to have a ripper of a good time. If you hang out with some Aussies or some South Africans, you'd be guaranteed a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, that's so cool. Yeah, so yeah. true, though. Like, you know, I, actually, I heard something recently that just resonated with what you were saying is like when you're making decisions in life, you should, it should either be a hell yeah or a no. I can't believe just, you just said you know, that. Yeah, like I was literally sick. listening to that. It was an Abraham Hicks. Oh, and yeah. Esther was just saying it needs to be a hell yeah or it's a no. Well, there you go. Synchronicity. <laughs> literally, not kidding. I'm trying to show you on my camera. Okay. No way. That's crazy. Right Seriously, that's the one. <laughs> but I think it's so true, isn't it? Like, you know, like it just, it, you must either just be a big yes, as you said. Yes. Or like, or just say no, you know, like don't, in, don't have these in between things, you know, when in doubt, wait it out because there's some reason that you're not getting a big yes on it. If it's not flowing, it's not going, that's not the big yes. And that's not how I live. I have learned to live by the big yes. That's still small voice. And if, if I could leave people with anything at all, please listen to and honor it because someday, some, somehow, some way by through this, through this opportunity you've given me, I hope that a lot of people will start to honor that. And they may not say, oh, I'm not getting a big yes on that, but find some way to honor how you feel. It's so easy to say, I'm not really getting a big, a, a big yes on that and have the other person go, oh, okay, mate, no worries. There must mm -hmm. be something else for you to do. Fuck, I, I know. I'm fresh out of crystal balls. I don't know. <laughs> uh, classic. Uh, and brilliant. <laughs> when are you, you going to interview Abraham Higgs on your, on your show? Oh, uh, not soon enough. That's the answer. <laughs> That'd be epic. That'd be epic. That would be epic. Yeah. It would. It was, so, I saw Oprah do it. She shifted around real uh, uncomfortable. I'd be like, Oprah, step aside. I got this. I got this sorted out. Don't you worry about it. Yeah. yeah I think <laughs> Abraham Higgs is one of those people that I think people could misunderstand or, or like judge too quickly. But the actual sense that comes out of what she's saying is, is quite incredible, actually. Yeah. And it only says it over and over and over again. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and I, 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 wanted, I wanted to share something real quick with you guys. Um, since we're talking about Abraham Hicks, if I may. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So, so, um, so see it, say it, make it so, or name it, claim it, make it so, or see it, say it, let it go. That's kind of more of an Abraham Hicks thing. See it, say it, let it go. And that, um, that whole like fixation on the details and ah, really I've learned stay focused on the what and the how will make itself known. And by following the big yes, we then have an opportunity to actually stay on the course instead of going, ah! You know, because we think it needs to go that way, right? Because we're fixated on, I'm going to make this happen. Well, um, there are things that happen that have absolutely nothing to do with a vision board. They have absolutely nothing to do with a mantra. You didn't dream it up. It didn't even intend. I didn't intend to be in Australia. I didn't intend for a lot of things to happen. And there it happened anyway. And to be able to go with the flow, no matter what it is, if you're drawn to this thing instead of that thing, and it wasn't at all in the plan, let that be okay. You know what? Life comes with erasers. You know, like you can go, oh, it does. I mean, it's not like you can take something back, but for God's sakes, it's, it's, it's a malleable 
kind of pliable thing. And to think that as a, you know, as a kid, you know, 20, 18, I have to pick a career. I don't even know what to do. Like, right. So when in doubt, wait it out. Like, check it out. Take a gap year. Go explore. Do something else, you know, because there's, if you don't know, there's a reason why. I mean, I don't know is the beginning of new possibilities. And as long as we're open to what, you know, other ideas could possibly come out, that's awesome. But if we're not seeking anything else and you just want to sit in the muck and mire for a while, you're welcome to. Life won't mind. You know, it's entirely up to you how it goes. But, but to think that you have to figure it out or you can't step out the door is ridiculous. It drives me crazy. And every day, millions of people do this same thing. And they, and they, and they go and they, they don't have the vision board. They don't have the mantra. They don't even know God. And they make it back home. They all went to the grocery store and they came back. And it's shocking and it worked out, you know? <laughs> so you could go to France on the same premise, guys. Just go. Do it. Live out loud. You're still fogging a mirror. You know? Yeah. We've all made it. Just saying. So true. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so Sorry. much value. Wow. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, so well Lex is just the show, but I am so passionate yeah. about that. I mean, come on. There, you know, there's all this, oh, we need to be all so clear on, you know, the Abraham Hicks thing about you know, and, and the, what's in your vortex and the, and the positivity. Let me tell you something. When I, when I was a crackhead on the street and I didn't have a place to stay that night and there were some things I was doing and the way I was living that I'm not proud of, it didn't jack up. I didn't die. Nobody hurt me. I didn't have bad shit in my vortex. I had people show up anyway. It always yeah. works out, you know? Yeah always works out so to, to to get back to your question about what about these midlifers and they're kind of going oh, i don't know yes you do and if you don't know then that's okay find somebody who's one step ahead of you we'll help you out yeah. Yeah. that's so true i think the bigger picture is is not something that we can see necessarily and we we like to think we can but yeah. you know it's all on the journey for us anyway and just embrace <laughs> that stuff as you said in the beginning just embrace what's happening you know there you go Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, look, just before we, Gareth, ask you the last question that before we finish off, um, can you maybe just tell us a little bit about what you're planning at the moment and in the coming weeks and months and also where people can contact you? Thank you. I have, um, so, uh, the Alexis Ray.com Alexis at the Alexis Ray.com is a good place to send an email. Um, my plans are to actualize a vision, of taking some midlife women on the midlife my ass tour uh, mm -hmm. with their bucket life bucket list item tucked under their arm and an adventure guide a genuine adventure guide um, to push past their limits or what they think are their limits and have some really cool travel adventure shows and um, uh, a vision came to me that I'm sitting on the sofa uh, across from Ellen. I can feel the material. I know this is real. It's, it is, I've burst into tears twice over this thing. So I, I know it's like TikTok. When are we going to get to do this? Because I'm ready. I'm ready right now. But in the meantime, until that happens, um, midlifemyass.com is available for, for women to catch up. Um, it's also on Facebook. It's a group. It's a group. Um, because I really want to help them untie those cement shoes and get up in that hot air balloon ride. That's what I do. I also help people with their messaging so that it's clear and concise and then they're not an annoying podcast guest. Awesome. <laughs> well, we need more of you. Yeah. You definitely haven't been an annoying or boring podcast guest. That's uh, the complete opposite, that's for sure. So, um, I like to walk my talk, mate. <laughs> yeah, the, the midlife um, idea that you have sounds like the, the movie Bucket List with um, yes. Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. Like That's what kind of reminds you of. Yes, I think there's nothing worse than having somebody get older and say, is this all there is? Or am I too late to have this dream come true? Mm. That absolutely breaks my heart. Mm. And I'm so, so, so passionate. So if they, want, if they have a story in them, a book, to tell, a book, I don't care, whatever it is, I, I can help that story get out loud and proud. But if they just want to go like confront their mom about something, I can help them with that too. Because I'm a transformational coach, um, inspirational speaker. And, um, and I have a book out, uh, Wake Up Winning, which is a bunch of stories of other people that have overcome big challenges. Beautiful. Cool stuff. Cool. So Thanks. we have one, uh, one final question for you. What okay. does being ridiculously human mean to you? 
I think it, it's authenticity on steroids. Mm. I do. I think that uh, we are capable of so much. And if we just authentically express what that is, that is ridiculously human. <laughs> I love it. So it's so, so true. true. <laughs> so true. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Alexis, you certainly speak our language. I promise you. Like, oh. um, it's. Uh, I'm just so happy that our paths have crossed. Seriously, it's it's a it's a delight yeah. to be in your presence and to well hear your message, hear your story. It's been an amazing. Yeah, it's been in a. It's been a fascinating, hard, tough journey and challenge for you but the main thing is is like i don't know how but you have somehow always had this clarity it seems you know that there was something else you know what i mean and that is amazing especially in those dark times um and it's really important for people to understand that because there's so many people who are struggling and don't know quite what to do you know, but having people like yourself that have overcome these tough times really allows them to realize that, okay, cool, there is still something else out there for me. And yeah, so your, your, your whole thing, your, 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 you have this aura, I reckon, about you. And uh, there was, honestly, there were so many like, like, golden nuggets in there i was like wow this is great this is great this is great i'm taking this i'm taking this um you know things in there that uh, that you said and obviously you've learned these over time and it's, it's just really really amazing so um thank you for sharing your story thank you for uh, telling it so well you are a true storyteller you have an amazing tone of voice and very tone of voice so we i I'm, I really look forward to listening to this one. That's for sure. It's one I'm definitely not going to listen to at one and a half times the speed like I normally do. <laughs> I'm going to listen at all the speed <laughs> um, so I can hear you speak. Um, but yeah, thank you so much uh, for coming on our podcast and for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you beyond words. Big time. Big time. Big just, time. I've been watching this moment since January. Go ahead, Craig. I'll let you talk. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to say just briefly, thanks from my side as well. Look, I mean, Gary said it really well. Mm. Clarity for sure. And, but also just that, that authenticity on steroids. I really like that. That's, that's you, you know, like, and I love that, you know, it's just, it's so infectious and it, you know, as you both mentioned, it just gives other people that permission to do the same. And it feels good yes. when you do, you know, um, yes. it feels so good to be able to say, this is me unabashedly, you know, I have had these crazy times because everyone has had these same things in different forms, you know, like in their lives. So it's just better just to get it out there. And, you know, the, your reinventing of yourself over the years and just, just going, going for it. Hell yeah. You know, like, and I just love it, you know, so keep it up. And uh, thank you for the inspiration. You're inspiring um, not just middle-aged uh, or midlife crisis people. It's like definitely more than that. So, so definitely keep going with your message because there are a lot of young people that, that might be in that situation that you were once in as well. And they can just look forward and say, cool, there's so much life ahead of me. And that's what you're like allowing them to see. So it's great yeah. stuff. So, so thank you from my side as well. Oh, you're going to make me craft my mascara again, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so much for the beautiful words vision. and the encouragement. Yeah. Uh, so you young people, I'll, I'll be the one dancing circles around you at the EDM show. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic. Hi. Got some glow stick moves, yo. What's up? <laughs> Play on, Blair. <laughs> Cool. All right. Cool. Alexa, that's amazing. Thank you so much. That's so cool. Yeah. Great podcast. Thank you <laughs> so yeah. much for the opportunity, guys. Beyond excited and, and honored. Thank you. Cool. Thank you for an outstanding, you know, interview. One, two punch. It was just like, you guys work really well together. And thank you for that. Thank I, was, you. know, the storyboarding was really, really good. And, and um, I'm impressed. Thank yeah. you. Likewise. We, you did a great job and you yeah. lived up to what you do very well as being a, a good guest speaker. So thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. Love. Thanks. Cool. Reluctantly. 
but I'll do it. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Thank eh? You. Have a good one. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy.